There is no personal advantage to spiritual practice. If you are here to get something, to make yourself special in the eyes of the universe, to distinguish yourself above and beyond your common man, your fellow man, woman, If you want to free yourself of suffering and discomfort and somehow escape the inevitability that you're going to die, then you've come to the wrong place. It's really a problem in seeking spiritual advantage because it really separates you from the truth. Here's the simple truth. You are mortal, temporary. Your life is going to have good moments and bad moments. You are going to go on the same adventure as everybody else, basically from birth to death. You're going to explore the nooks and crannies of materialized manifested existence and you're going to move on. Buddha really said that the <clears throat> essence of human life is suffering, and I don't think any of you could deny that. I'm very, very aware of my own journey, and I'm very aware of, of your journeys, whether I know the particulars of them or not. I can tell you, your days are full of... of uh, struggle. Some days better than others, some days happier than others, some days worse than others. But it is not an easy passage through the realm of manifest being. And we create these uh, forms, ideas, structures, personalities, uh, identities that help navigate in their own funny way through the world that we're inhabiting and often making terrible mistakes, often highly misguided, often driven by emotion or incorrect thinking or fears or ambitions or all of this stuff. And somewhere along the way we kind of learn it doesn't work, and so what works? Where do we find the thing that works? And everybody begins a search for that. Not everybody. You know, some people don't. My brother found Sudoku. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's better than most meditative practices for him. And, and, I'm, and all I can tell you is the idea that you are going to enter into a meditative state and rise out of all this human dilemma is an illusion. You don't rise out of the human condition. What happens, if you're lucky, is you become aware of what a gift 
and the measurable blessing just being is. Just being. Meaning your confusion, your misguidedness, your suffering, your hopes and dramas and fears. It, in a way you wouldn't trade it for anything. For a reason. Because it's an exquisite state of reality. Being is so remarkable, so beyond the mind's capacity to grasp it. And yet, here we are, moment to moment, going, Oh God, if only I could have that, or why did that happen, or how can I get free of this, or what's wrong with me, or why doesn't anyone understand it? All of that stuff that goes on, and thinking, Oh, I can meditate myself into some kind of higher, higher state, a spiritual state. Well, I have really come, abhor is a big word, but I'll use it, to abhor the word spiritual. I do not like the word spiritual because I really don't know what it is. What is spiritual? How is it in any way distinguished from whatever this is? Why is it perceived as somehow better, higher, other? One of the incredible things Rudy taught me early on was that this is your spiritual life. This, all of this crappy, crazy, day-to-day, -day, get up, do it again, get out of bed, brush your teeth, go to work, go home, watch the news, go to sleep, up. you know, that's life. And it is also your spiritual container. It's all one big thing, and all of us are caught in it because our minds are so wildly engaged in all the elements of it that we don't have any perspective and we don't have any guidance through the craziness of the manifested existence. So we're just like flotsam and jetsam moving through life. Things happen to us. They don't happen. We do our best to get through it, and then we make a big mess of things, and then a big thing, wonderful thing happens, and we think, oh, we're saved, and then a terrible thing happens, and we're, we're not saved. And we, we go through these endless, endless configurations of human experience. It is human experience. This idea of spiritual means that there is something infusing the human experience, that there's something underlying it, that there's something, in a sense, separate from it, or maybe transcendent of it. But what you begin to discover inside, if you start to meditate and you start to sit still, is you start to find your way not into a metaphysical place, but in truth a physical place. Not into a supernatural state, but a natural state. It's just very refined. It's very natural. It's very physical. And you find your way down into the depth of a kind of okayness, presence, awareness, clarity, ease, comfort, embrace, and it's sitting inside you. You find your way into this place through meditation, is a doorway, an absolute doorway into this place inside yourself that is an allowing of whatever comes to be. And this allowing is so profoundly stabilizing and satisfying and in its own funny way, joyful. That you start to appreciate deeply this experience of being. Sitting regularly in some disciplined way and being present is a doorway into something phenomenally uh, thrilling, if you want to put it that way. And it's not discoverable as much as it is something that starts to reveal itself. And it can reveal itself in a sudden burst of awareness, slowly over time, or 
it may not even reveal itself just because it is. And revelation is not required. But what comes is the fact that you are a tiny piece of something infinite and vast. That you exist within this unbelievable envelope of being. And that that being that you have is immeasurable. It has no content, no quality, no reference point. It just embraces and filters through and is in a way the sustenance of all there is. And it's what you are. It's what you are. This idea of being this separate thing, this human thing, this person, this thing that was born, the idea that you are that is where we run into trouble. Because you think in some way you are separate from all that is. You are not separate. And the idea that that thing that you have imagined as separate will get an advantage from touching base with the infinite is crazy. Because the infinite is the advantage. The infinite is everything. And it's what you already are. The idea of attaining it, of getting there, of arriving at it, if you're a good person or a spiritual person, or you do the right things, or you go to church every week, or whatever your idea is, it's crazy because you're already, already blessed, already advantaged. You're already the thing you're looking for. This idea that it will happen to you if you do something or live in a certain way or have a spiritual life or meditate, you know, every 20 minutes, you know, or spend your whole life doing it, I, whatever that is. No, no, it's not like that. It's, this is already it. And I know you have days of total misery. And I know you have days where you're so discombobulated and you don't know what's going on and you're lost and you're unhappy and your emotions are all over the place and you want help and freedom and release from all of this. All I can tell you, just say yes to the what is. Just say yes. Or the other term which I love, even this. Even this. Even this madness, this craziness, this discombobulation, this endless demand on your life, the fact that you can't communicate what you want to say properly, the fact that people don't get you, that whatever your thing is, it's okay. Even this is that. Even this weird life that we have is one with that vastness of true being that is at the essence of you. And the doorway to that, if you need a doorway to it because you're living in it, but the doorway to it is deep inside, uh, say, your heart chakra. Go inside and open and relax and allow it to take <coughs> you in and express how big it is, how it envelops the totality of you. How this is the, uh, this is what it, this is what you're looking for. This very thing is what you're looking for. It's not out there. Nobody can give it to you. Nobody can hand it over. And once it is handed over, if you walk two steps thinking you're better than somebody else, guaranteed, <coughs> it's going to knock you on your head. The minute you think, I got it, I have it, it's going to take it away. Because there is no one to have it. There is no one to get it. It is gotten. It is already had. It already is. All you can do is go, oh. Oh. That's all you can do. <coughs> wow. 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 The minute you think, I am awake, I'm enlightened, I am perfect, I am all of this, you've already put it into two. I am, two. I am this. There's no I am this. There only is I am. You know, I have that on my piano downstairs, that little um, sort of tablet that says from the Bible, be still and know that I am. In truth, the statement in biblical terms is be still and know that I am God. But the curtailing of that to be still and know that I am 
gets rid of the limited idea that you are something called God. It has no limitation. I am is infinite and endless, and it is the truth of what you already are and already will be. You are at the heart and core of the mystery of being as we speak. And to miss that fact, to walk around going, oh my God, I got to get to this place and I got to get there and I don't want to go to that thing and I got to do this. Yes, that's part of the human experience, but it's not the best version of it in terms of what is possible. To live in the mystery of being, in the wonder of being, and all you're caring about is the Sudoku puzzle is going to give you a limited experience of the wonder and mystery of being alive. I don't want to be critical of that because my brother, for all I know, gets deeper into the core of the mystery in a Sudoku puzzle than I ever will sitting and meditating. I don't know. I don't know. But I will tell you, there is something wildly, wildly adventurous and remarkable in having the courage to get through a day one day, to turn off the light at night and go, wow, wow, that was amazing. And it is amazing. And I, I am now at the end of the journey. I mean, I may have years left, I have no idea, but I'm at the end of the productive journey of doing. <clears throat> I'm not writing movies, I'm not birthing children, or I don't birth them, but giving, helping them get born. <laughs> I'm, not protect, I'm not having a life with, uh, you know, where I'm responsible to pay for them to you know, have food on the table. I'm just alive. I'm just alive. And I don't have a lot to do. And not having a lot to do is a fascinating thing to arrive at. It's called retirement in our culture, but it's absolutely exquisite in terms of if you can just sit back and not stress over having nothing to do and just be still and find what arises. And every day stuff arises, whether it be in the newspaper, email, a thought that comes up, a flower that blooms in your backyard, something arises. And I have begun to witness that arising. I have begun to witness life in a way that I never was able to do when I was in the doing stages of things. Doing was essential. It made it important to keep active. And there are people who must do to the last moment of their life. But after a while, you start to realize even in doing, you can witness yourself. You can witness truth. You can witness reality. The great gift that Rudy gave me was sit every day and be quiet, be still, open and witness. And so I lived a life of doing and witnessing simultaneously. So when the doing fell away, the witness remained. And I've taken to doing a lot of what I call walking. Many other people call it walking. But it is, <clears throat> it is a very deep version of walking because... It'll, I'm starting to see life for the first time in a way I never imagined. I'm seeing more deeply into the expression of things every day. I, I think I've expressed this to you, but I started seeing stuff on the sidewalk that hits me in the face, and I go, my God, that's beautiful. I see flowers opening in ways that I've never seen flowers before. I see <clears throat> the world coming at me as gift upon gift upon gift. And I think you may know I've started taking my camera and shooting pictures of all this stuff. And then I start playing with these pictures and trying to, what I would call, frame the world, frame little pieces of the world. And I suddenly realize I know what it is to be an artist. I understand that an artist is framing the what is in a tiny little place so we can see the whole. In that little space, we can see everything. And I have never looked at life that way. I've started seeing stuff on the street that has such richness of texture and design and beauty and cosmic nature, like starscapes and planetary visions. And I'm going, I never knew that was there. I never knew it. And I, and I go, click. And then I have this moment when I go click of going, oh, and I call it an aesthetic moment. 
like it lines up. I go, oh, wow. And then I get home and I see it on the screen and I go, <laughs> and then I play with it. Artist smiling here. Thanks, Carol. You, 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 I start playing with it and I do, I do, I change the contrast and, and coloration sometimes. I do little, sometimes very little things, sometimes big things. And I keep finding more and more and more in that space that I just caught off the, off the, the, the street. And then all of a sudden it goes, ah, ah. it clicks. And that aesthetic moment is so riveting. It's so arriving. It's so acknowledging of something. And it doesn't last all that long except, except it, it's permanent. It's like looking at a Monet, a Cezanne. I mean, you can pick your artist. You look at their paintings, you know, they got it. They took them a lot longer. They didn't just snap a picture. They actually saw it, drew it, framed it, caught it, put it out there, and people now spend, you know, millions of dollars to capture and own their moment. <laughs> you know, the truth is that moment is there for us every second, always around us. The wonder of being, the majesty of existence is always there once you start to see. And it took me all of these years to retire so I could just walk without having anything to do. I didn't have to think of a story to write about. I didn't have to think of how to make money. I didn't have to think about anything. I just walked. Just walked. And then there it was, always there. And all this stuff is coming at me. I'm hearing. I've never heard before. I'm hearing things like birds. You know, a lot of you hear, I mean, forgive me, I just never heard the birds. And now, they're, now they are a symphony of song as I'm walking. <clears throat> and all I can tell you, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> is this worldly stuff kind of begins to fall away or impregnates you with uh, a stillness. When you finally arrive at a stillness, the world reveals itself as it has always been. The joy of all of this is that it's right there. I don't have to go anywhere. I just have to get still enough, retired enough, quiet enough, centered enough to see what's in front of me. And you all have the same option, the same exact thing. Now, some of you are not going to be artists, but I was watching the Golden State Warriors last night playing San Antonio, and, and you know, and I've talked about this before, but I'm, there are certain moves on the court that are as deeply aesthetically satisfying as the moment that you see in a painting. There are moments in everyday reality when my grandchildren say something in a certain way and I go, oh, they got it, they captured it. These moments are happening in life all the time, all around us. So you don't have to do, be a photographer, you don't have to go through the way that I'm describing. In your own particular way, you will find that moment. It may even be the lineup of a Sudoku. It doesn't matter. Find the doorway into this very extraordinary space that you have lived in forever. Trust me, you didn't, the past was never the past, it was always present. The future will never be future, it will always be present. This is all corny stuff, but it's true. You have always lived here, <clears throat> and here is either mundane, boring, <clears throat> repetitive, dramatic, unhappy, <clears throat> whatever it is, whatever your thing is, or find your still point and the aesthetic truth of it goes pop. And you see it for the first time. You see the sunrise for the first time. You see the, <clears throat> in a way, whatever you're looking at for the first time. So, <clears throat> move beyond this idea of specialness. Move beyond the idea that there is a you to be made exalted. Because that you is going to die. <clears throat> it's short-lived. It has very little to do other than to be here as a witness and an embracing element of the totality that we're in. <clears throat> there is an extraordinary <coughs> excuse me, way to be in the world. In meditation, Sitting still, opening, allows for that to take place. It doesn't make you special, it just makes you who you are. Human. Real. Alive.
This is the journey, guys. This is the whole journey. The whole journey is to get to right now. The whole journey is to be here. The whole journey is not to come to meditation for 30 years so you can get an advantage. The whole idea is to get the advantage that already exists by being aware of who you are. That's it. That's it. I don't know how many other ways to say it. I know there are millions of ways to say it, but that's, it's got to find a way in. And it comes basically by just going, I'll trust what he said. Okay, this is it. How do I get, how do I get to get quiet enough to really see it? Well, everyone who sits in this room has learned how to do it. You've all learned how to do it. You all know how to sit. You all know how to be. Do it. Be it. It's really easy. Any questions? Um, there's a friend of mine who, when he turned 30, he said, he looked back and he said, shit, I really wish that I didn't worry so much. And that's always haunted me. Like, you look back and go, God, I've survived a lot, and I'll continue to survive a lot. And so, I always wonder, if we're here to struggle, and within the struggle you learn and you have realization, then when we come here, and we're kind of getting neutralized in a way, and being able to take everything in proper perspective, is there a way to stay in that place where it's like, you're looking at things, you're going through the struggle of life, but you take the struggle out, because you're saying, this is as it should be. Can you still learn those lessons without having to be brought to your knees, without having the highs and lows? That, to me, is always a paradox, because you want to take that lesson in at the same time. Can you do it with a little less wear and tear and just know and have faith that we are going to get there? Well, yeah, you can. You know, it's called trust. It's, uh, <clears throat> more importantly, I have to say, when you sit deeply, quietly, you kind of know it. You see the worries as what they are, you know, just the brain. So can you get there without having to feel all those bumps and everything? Can you just say, this is the ride and it's going to be this way? In other words, can you, like every time you do a life that seems like incarnate, uh -huh. there's lessons that you set up for yourself to learn. Well, we think that's the case. We think that's the case, right? Yeah. Karmic things you've got to pay off and right. everything. Right. So if you're able to roll with everything and you don't feel those, are you going to, are you, do you have to come back and do it again, or is it like, no, that's... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, my, no, my, my guess is it is what it is. It just is what it is. I, you know, I, I still have worries and stuff that comes up, and I go, oh, okay. I, you know, what's so interesting to me is <clears throat> you suddenly just give it a, a consent. You just go yes to it. You stop fighting it. You, I mean, discomfort is going to be there. The, as long as you have an existential reality, meaning limited time, and a body that's going to start at some point falling away, and uncomfortably so, you've got stuff to deal with. You just do. I don't care who you are. I don't care how enlightened you are. <clears throat> You're going to have to deal with <clears throat> all of this stuff. Life is a, is a struggle between competing forces. The ones that want to live forever, and the ones that are scared to death, and all these, other, all these things that want to somehow <clears throat> be better than, you know, happier than, different than what you are. It causes so much upheaval going on, and so all you have to go is, well, there's upheaval. Oh, upheaval again. <clears throat> oh. The idea that you can get to some place as a permanent condition. I, uh, uh, well, one, if you do get a place to a, 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 that's a permanent condition, you definitely won't be able to hold it. Because holding it is already creating a, a thing that's going to be prepared to have to lose it. You can't hold anything forever. So it has to be there as a condition that just exists without you being in there interacting with it or trying to preserve it on some level so you can benefit from, oh, thank God, I'm now above struggle and worry and drama, so now I'm free. But, oh, oh, oh there's, the thought, there's a little bit of worry there. Oh, my God, oh, psh, I'm not going to have to. You, know, you, you can't live like that. It's like, aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. Even this, even this, and it just comes up like a mantra, even this. And what happens is it settles you into something that is already there, which is an underlying vastness that cares nothing for your troubles. 
not that, I mean, it, look, it loves you, but it knows it's, it's given you life. And by giving you life in this world of temporary manifested state, it knows that it's got problems because there's always the fear of, of impermanence. Always. How do you get rid of impermanence? How do I get the permanent thing? Well, the permanent thing underlies the impermanent. And it's all one breathing thing. It's one thing, not two. It's one thing. And as long as there's a you and an it, or a you that wants it to be a little different, you've separated yourself from the permanent, and you've become impermanent and open to suffering. And most of us are thrust into impermanence by being born. But is there a reason for that? Well, my answer is always stupid and simple. One, ice cream. Two, my grandchildren. And not in that order. Well, maybe. <laughs> but that's, I, I, why do we come into this? We are, do we choose to? I don't know the answer to that. But we are definitely here. I have ideas in my brain to explain it, why it's worth suffering to come here. And it has to do with seeing and knowing who I am. I have manifested in billions and billions of bodies to see me from every conceivable angle, to know what I am, because I am a mystery. And this is a way of knowing. And I, it's also, if you're deeply, deeply singular and alone, which I am, the I am is, how does it move beyond that for a brief moment or for a few billion years? It creates otherness. It creates the other. And we interact with the other as though we're separate and different. And we create drama and comedy and joy and misery and all that other stuff. And then every so often, because we get lost in that, there's someone who comes and looks at you in a way that sees itself. And you see yourself looking at you, and I see myself looking at you, and we see who we are. And we go, oh yeah, oh yeah. That's what it does. That's the joy. And I, I, don't, I don't know beyond that. I'm giving you my own answers. They may be wrong. But it doesn't matter. I think the word mystery has, is a reason for being mysterious. It's because it's unanswerable. You know, the Hebrew idea of God is that it's, it's unknowable. I buy into that totally. It's unknowable. And so how do you live in a world that's unknowable? Well, I will tell you one hint. You can't navigate through it with your brain or your emotions but you can navigate through it if you discover deep inside yourself what I call the navigation system. I don't know what it is, but there is something deep, profoundly buried inside our heart chakra, if you will, in our chest that knows. It doesn't know the answer. It just knows this much. Turn left. Forward. Turn right. Stop. Go. This way. This way. And you listen to it. And you find that it guides you through unbelievably treacherous waters. And it does it with a kind of precision and brilliance and insight that has an aesthetic element. You go, wow, wow. And it really has to do with being open and saying yes to the existence of what is rather than no, I can do better. <laughs> this will figure it out, you know. Anyway, it's, we're... <coughs> There's a million ways to talk about this, millions of ways to talk about it, and this is one way. You know, if it sparks an awakening, great. If it doesn't spark an awakening, you know, just take another step and enjoy your day, because it doesn't matter on some level. And if it does spark an awakening, don't go, oh my God, I awoke now, I can have anything I want in life. Now it will all come to me. Because I've watched that happen to people, and boy, oh boy, the universe knocks you down really fast. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. I will be here next month and, uh, and every other month uh, for as long as anybody shows up. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>